Behind me is the visitor center for the Chancellorsville Battlefield. And this path that has been placed here to allow foot traffic actually traces the path along the mountain road that was being used by Stonewall Jackson and a small group, uh, less than a dozen of his staff, as they attempted to scout a way forward to continue the attack on the Union flank. It's a very busy road, as you can hear, just to the right of me. But about 100 yards behind me, just on the other side of the visitor center, would have been where the Confederate lines were. And they were waiting for orders to move forward. A man under AP Hill. So Jackson rode forward with a small group around 9 p.m., trying to scout a way forward. Uh, lagging behind him was AP Hill with another group of men, and they continued their path forward. And of course, unfortunately, we know what happened next. I'm now standing right next to the visitor center and you can see behind me the monument or the marker that we were just looking at a moment ago. Jackson made it a little further past that marker. He could hear the sound of federal soldiers with their axes trying to clear uh, places for uh, building entrenchments and placing their artillery. But he realized there was no way forward uh, in the darkness. And so at about 9.15, he began to ride back. Uh, and there were North Carolina troops, I believe the 18th North Carolina, uh, were just down the road from here. When Jackson got to about this spot where I'm standing, shots rang out. They were smooth bores uh, by the 18th North Carolina. This was really at the about the extent of their range. And honestly, it was a, a pretty big surprise they hit anything at all. And most of the other men in Jackson's party weren't hit. But Jackson was hit three times. Uh, one of his eccentricities was that he would often ride with his right arm above him while on a horse. He took a bullet in the hand on his right arm. arm. It was a relatively minor wound, but the two bullets that hit him in the upper and lower left arm were much more significant. His horse bolted uh, toward the orange uh, turnpike, and it's over there that a monument has been placed for Jackson's wounding. That's actually the place where his staff caught up to him, got the horse to stop, and lowered Jackson from his horse. This is the direction that Jackson's horse bolted. It didn't get very far before his staff caught up. They caught up to him here, they lowered him from his horse. And it was at that moment they realized how seriously he was wounded. When Jackson's staff brought him down from his horse, they took out handkerchiefs. They tied them above and below the wounds on his left arm. 
they did such a great job with that that when a doctor arrived with an actual tourniquet, he decided not to apply it because they had already done a, a good enough job with the, the handkerchiefs. They loaded him up on a stretcher and began to move back toward the Confederate lines. A.P. Hill, whose party had also been fired on and whose party had suffered much more significant uh, injury and death from the shooting because they were closer to the Confederate lines. A.P. Hill yelled for the men to stop firing that they were firing on their own men. But somebody shouted out in the, in the darkness that it was a lie and they should pour it into them. So they kept on firing. Artillery opened up. In fact, one of the artillery shells tore through the arms of one of the men who was carrying Stonewall Jackson. And so the litter dropped as much as three feet. And it was said that Jackson let out a, a really pitiful groan. And some people have actually speculated that that injury that he suffered while dropped from the stretcher actually led to the pneumonia that killed him several days later. We're now on the Wilderness Battlefield, and I'm walking along a gravel road that is close to the public for driving, but can still be walked on. And we're headed to the, the home known as Elwood, which is owned by the same Lacey family that owned Chatham Manor, which we visited on the Fredericksburg Battlefield opposite the town of Fredericksburg. Elwood was owned by the brother of Stonewall Jackson's chap chaplain. And when Jackson's arm was amputated about a half a mile east of here, he didn't want to see it thrown on the pile with all the other limbs that were being amputated in the Confederate Field Hospital where it took place. So he brought it to the private family cemetery at Elwood, gave it a Christian burial. We're going to take a look at that site later on during the Battle of the Wilderness this home served as Governor Warren's headquarters. It was said that Union soldiers dug up the arm of Stonewall Jackson, and they may or may not have reburied it in the same location.
So let's finish up the conversation about Jackson's flank attack and his wounding from the quiet and warmth of my car. You can see the red on my face. That's from how the wind was blowing. It's a pretty long walk to get to Elwood, to the Lacey house. But Jeb Stewart took over Jackson's Corps and led it ably for the rest of the battle. There was a lot of battle left to be fought after the flank attack. Uh, it was far from over at that point. But Jackson was taken 25 miles from here to Guinea Station, uh, where he was placed in the office building on a plantation. It was about a 12-hour bumpy ride for a man who had just had his arm amputated. There his wife was able to come and visit with him and be with him. And when his pneumonia set in and it started to get worse, and Dr. McGuire, who had done the amputation, uh, informed Jackson's wife and Jackson that he was very soon to pass away. Uh, his wife asked Jackson, who was a very religious man, deeply spiritual, and she informed him that he was likely to die that day, and it was a Sunday. And she asked him, are you ready to go if the Lord calls you home today? And he said, I prefer it. Uh, Jackson always wanted to die on a Sunday, if possible. Toward the... Um, the end of his life, he started to get a little bit delirious, started to have hallucinations, started calling for AP Hill to come to the front and uh, was shouting out commands. And then he got very calm and he said, let us cross over the river and rest under the shade of the trees. And with that, General Jackson died. His body was taken back to Lexington where he was buried. I had the chance to visit his grave a number of years ago when I was in college on the track team. We had a, a meet at Washington Lee University. But uh, the story of the Civil War goes on for another two years after that. But this was the high water mark, I think, for the Confederacy. It was all downhill after Chancellorsville, especially after losing Jackson. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, and let's continue the conversation. Thanks for watching.